नमस्कार इन द लास्ट क्लास आई एक्सप्लेन टू यू हाउ मूवमेंट अफेक्ट्स ह्यूमन इंजीनियरिंग एंड हाउ ट्रैकिंग ऑफ मूवमेंट्स कैन हेल्प अस इन डिजाइनिंग बेटर कंट्रोल्स आई गिव द एग्जांपल ऑफ अ क्रेन ड्राइवर हु यूजेस हिज क्रेन टू परफॉर्म सर्टेन एक्शंस which are necessary for loading and unloading in the ship dockyard and i showed to you how with the use of few levers the person can achieve the task which has been provided to him in previous classes we have looked at the physiological and the cognitive constraints of humans and how do they help the human uh, uh, psychologist and how do they help the human engineering psychologist in this particular section we are looking at how the execution part of information processing helps in designing better systems i created a scenario where i showed that how this crane driver when realizes that a certain accident is on the verge how he manipulates the lever to stop the crane in mid air and we dissected this whole scenario in terms of his movements i discussed about reaction times and movement time and how open loop and closed loop systems aid in performing movement accuracy the fact that i was discussing is those factors which help in making movements so that certain actions can be performed in a more accurate and error free way i explain to you how the hickheimen law and the fitz law talks about sizes of control and the distance that people have to make in terms of making certain accurate movements and how speed and accuracy they are counter to each other today's section we'll look at controls now whenever a human makes a movement this motion or movement is towards a control controls are necessary part of our everyday work environment and also the home environment because this is the interface which connects the human output to the machine input in more simplest word this is that part which interacts with the human to perform certain kind of actions on the machine counterpart so let's then discuss what are controls what are the various ways of designing control so that they can help us in making better and more accurate error free decisions and further to it we'll also see certain rules which guide the development of controls so in the study of movement which is a part of kinesiology an effector is a body part used to act usually an interaction with a object the control design is influenced by the effector with which it is meant to be used so effector is that body part which interacts with the control and makes the necessary desired change in the control two common effectors we know of is the hand and the leg the hand can be used in making a number of movement for example moving dials and rotating knobs and the foot can be used in making motions against paddles or making simple motions as in swing machines beside that we have also eye controlled motion and brain controlled motion but since most levers around us are functioned through hand and leg movement will concentrate on that now differences in variety and type of movements 
of the leg and the hand are described in terms of the degrees of freedom which refers to the number of movements that an effector can perform. While the hand has an opposing thumb and four fingers which are quite nibble and can perform a lot of actions, the foot on the other hand cannot perform so many actions because the foot in total makes an action. The toe can perform some individualized movements, but the four fingers with the toe in total will perform an action for example, putting pressure on a gas pedal. Similar is the idea of the ankle and the wrist, whereas the wrist can perform anti-clockwise and clockwise motion to certain degrees, the ankle cannot achieve these motions. And so the um, amount of motions and the type of motions that the hand can perform is far greater than the foot. This suggests that while designing levers and controls, this principle has to be kept in mind. Now controls can also be described based on the nature of the information that they input into the system they control. Some controls input certain numbers, other controls input certain motions, certain other controls are meant to input certain other kind of information. So a control is divided in terms of what information it is taking from the human and what information it is coding to the system so that the system functions in a better way. Now in terms of motions, controls can be divided into two different types. We have the discrete control and we have the continuous control. Let us look at a little bit into what are discrete and continuous controls. As the name suggests, discrete controls have fixed positions of on and off like this light switch, whereas the continuous controls are those which continuously manipulate a variable of interest or tracks changes. So discrete controls are those that allow information to be encoded in single isolated chunks. Pressing a button or flipping a switch is a discrete response that sends a signal or a command. A good example here is a light switch. It has two positions, either it could be on or it could be off. In the United States and the western countries, the switches when are towards the ceiling, they are on, but when it is depressed towards the floor, it is off. In the Asian countries, it is just the opposite. So, discrete controls are those controls which have fixed positions. On the contrary, we have continuous controls. Now, continuous controls allow the user to specify commands along a continuum as the control can be set to multiple positions. The accelerator pedal in a car is a typical example. So, the accelerator cannot be put into high low. The amount of pressure that you put in the accelerator will decide how fast you are moving. Similarly, certain knobs which have functions like the regulator button or the regulator knob in a fan are examples of continuous control because it has numbers written on them and these numbers will decide how fast the fan is working. So, this is an example of continuous control. As I explained, these are the examples of discrete and continuous control. So, this is an example of continuous control, this is an example of discrete control, again an example of discrete control, continuous control, continuous control and continuous control. Now, most of these controls are easy to handle, but we need a way to understand what a control does and the more explicit a control is, the more meaning that the control makes to the operator the easier it would be for the operator to operate the control. For those purposes, control coding was designed. Control coding is a way 
of assigning meaning to the control itself so that the operator can with let little effort understand what the control does and give the control commands for performance. Now key aspect of designing any control is making sure that the user knows what it does and can select the desired control. This designing of control is meant to have a property called affordance. Affordance suggests that certain objects has an inherent meaning or it by itself gives out what action should be performed on it. A good example could be the on button on your printer. When off, the button is a slightly above the surface and this suggests or provides you the affordance to press it by using pressure and depress it. Once you do that, the button becomes on and the printer gets on. So this is an affordance. <coughs> now the, when the user has to select among controls, this represents the problem of con control discrimination. One reason why control coding is important is because they would provide quick meaning to the operator as to what this control expects and what output it is going to give. On the other hand, those situations when you have a number of control levers, control coding would specify and highlight itself in the sea of controls that the operator is facing. Look at the cockpit. There are a number of buttons and number of dials and number of controls. One lapse of attention can lead to major errors. For that particular reason, controls on an aircraft cockpit are control coded in terms of either the shape or the movement or some other property. By coding controls according to what action the control will perform, the cognitive resources that the user is required to input for operating that control becomes less. And by coding control in different ways, the operator can easily discriminate which control is doing what function. So control discrimination is an important part of control coding. Now to increase the ease in recognition and discrimination of controls, we use control coding. What is it? It is the process of designing controls to be distinguished based on their shape, texture, color, size, location, mode of operation or by the label. So some of the factors which help us in coding the control or making the control discriminable among each other is these factors. What we will do next is we will take each of these factors one by one and try and explain to you how these factors matter and how these factors can help us in making better controls which are easily discriminable from each other. Let us look at the first factor which is called shape coding. Now in a cockpit you would find various controls have different shapes. The control for the flap wings which is the flap on the wing of an aircraft and the function of this flap is to increase the air resistance so that either the flight can land or take off. This control is shaped in terms of a flap on a wing. Similarly, the control which is used for lowering the wheel is shaped like a wheel and the action of lowering is mapped onto the control. By lowering the control down, the wheel will come down and by moving the control up, the wheel will move up. So this kind of shape coding can help us in performing a lot of control operations 
in an easy way. Now the shape of control communicates to the user what the control does and how it moves. The consideration of shape coding. By using shape of different types, the users will not only come to know how this shape is mapped to what function the actual machine is doing, but it will also tell what part of the machine is related to this control. So, not only the structure, but also the function of the machine part which is controlled by this lever can be coded using shape control. Users out to be able to distinguish the shapes by touch alone. While making shape coding, one of the things that helps is the idea that users can touch this control and when their eyes are busy doing something else, the touch itself will give us some idea as to what this control should be doing. The rectangular shape of the flap control is different from the circular shape of the wheel control. Also while designing shape controls, it, it should be possible to for the user to distinguish the shapes visually. So, not only by touch the visual should be able to distinguish the shape or different controls and discriminate among them. The other feature is that by looking at the control itself, the user should be able to distinguish what these two controls do. The shape of the control out to communicate its functions. One another important fact that shape controls tend to convey to the user is the function that this control does. Now, examples of shape control that can be discriminated by touch alone is this triangle here, this rectangle or more of a square here, this hexagon or octagon you may prefer these kind of shapes. Now, this kind of shape generally you will find in gears and levers and this kind of shape are very close to a steering wheel. So, this four different shapes and other shapes uh, like a square or, or a straight edge kind of a shape can be used for shaping control and mapping it to the function it does. The second type of control factor that we look is called label coding. So, you can use label also to code certain kind of controls or certain kind of levers. Now, sometimes controls are obvious in terms of how they are to be used. For example, door handles are meant to be pulled and push plates on door are for pushing. One of the problems with the doors around us is the doors are not coded properly. And by the work that Donald Norman has done on this uh, designing of badly designed doors are called Norman doors. Look around you, the door handle gives you some other information and this misleading information at times create problems for users. The handle of a door suggests that you should grab it and when you grab someone or something, you move it towards yourself. So, it should be opening outside. When you have a push plate, the affordance or what the push plate suggests is that you should be applying pressure onto the push plate and once you do that, the pressure automatically will move the door away from you. But often enough, you would have seen doors which have push plate but does not allow motion on the opposite direction. The push plate is used as a handle for pulling the door towards you and these kind of problems are called label control related problems and these controls can actually be improved by providing certain labels. Now, sometimes controls are not obvious. Some door designers are ambiguous and it is hard to know whether you are meant to push or pull a door. Those doors which move through motion sensors or glass doors which automatically move. There are times you would have yourself observed 
when you are in front of this door and the sensor is not working perfectly, you do not know what to do to open the door. So, some kind of a label can be provided which tells you what action you should do. Compare this with the door of a metro. In a metro, you have a door which has a label which turns green or red. The green suggests that you can pr apply pressure to it and the door will open and the red suggests that while moving, if you apply pressure, the door is not going to help. So, even if it has a door which uh, normally cannot be opened by pushing or pulling, but it has a label and this is how labels can be used for improving door functions. Now, some designers uh, are ambiguous and it is hard to know whether you are meant to push or pull the op door open. Now, these doors benefit from something called label coding, signs that instruct the user to push or pull. So, often enough you would have seen doors having this labels which says push or pull and this function of pushing and pulling will help in moving the door in an effective way because each door is put in a hinge and the hinge allows only certain movement. Label coding is often a sign, but the control was not well designed in the first place. So, look at all these doors and you will quickly realize that some of these doors are made in such a way that it becomes really difficult to make the motion. So, here providing labels or providing some kind of written alerts can help people in moving these controls. Another factor which can help in coding a control is a texture. Now, controls can be covered with different textures that can be discriminated by touch. Certain controls are very smooth and they suggest smooth motion like the knobs on radios or knobs on certain equipments. On the other hand, certain controls are made in such a way there are grooves on the control dial itself which suggests that the motion that you are going to do in this control are in discrete manner which means that it is a continuous control and it is you cannot move this control smoothly. So, this kind of texture gradients can be used for helping the user realize what is the function of this control. Now, examples of texture coding are smooth flut fluted or neural textures on knobs. Textures do not necessarily communicate control function, but can help users discriminate between similar looping, looking knobs or to recognize them in the dark. So, two benefits of using texture is that first you can discriminate one knob from the other in terms of texture. So, if a knob has let us say smooth versus fluttered exterior, even when it is dark, you can by touch itself know which control you are using and this is one interesting way of coding controls. Colors can also be used for coding controls. Distinguishing controls by color require consideration of visual abilities of the user, including the ability to distinguish shades of color, especially under various conditions of illumination or varying levels of visible ability. When designing a control with color, one inherent fact that designers should keep in mind is that people have different perceptions of color. Some people cannot see certain colors because of cert certain genetic problems or some other physiological problems. So, while designing a control using color, certain aspects related to the ability to distinguishing color and also the fact that certain colors are perceived only under certain lighting condition. So, under certain darkness or lightness, these colors will lo lose their uh, important property of being color. So, these considerations, the illumination as well as the fact that certain colors in are cannot be perceived 
should be kept in mind by designers while using color as a medium of coding controls. Now, one property of color with respect to control is its ability to communicate function. Color can be beautifully used for communicating function of the control. The green color tells you to go and the red color tells you to not go. So, this kind of color differentiation can help people in quickly realizing what the function of this control is. Also, red color suggests emergency stops whereas, the yellow color tells you to move cautiously and so these colors can help in describing the function of a control. As the color red is generally related to danger or emergencies, large red buttons on machinery are generally understood to be emergency off buttons. Also colors can communicate functions, red usually means stop, green usually means go. Now there are certain population stereotypes which can be used with colors. For example, users may have the expectation or prior knowledge that influence how they interpret different design features. So, population stereotype basically means that people are fixed with certain coding and changing that coding only confuses people. So, tomorrow if I design a control which replaces the green and red color in terms of the go and no go function with the red and uh, yellow color, people get confused. They are so bound to this color scheme and the function that replacing any other color with the red and green for the go and no go function would confuse people. So, while designing controls which uses color as a coding mechanism, these kind of population stereotypes or pre-learned behaviors of people in terms of functions of certain control should be kept in mind. Size of the control can also be one of the methods of coding controls. Size coding can be useful to help users discriminate similar looking controls. Although size is not a big variable in coding controls, but at times sizes can be used as a coding mechanism. But while using size as a coding mechanism, the control must be at least 20 percent different in size in order for this to be useful design feature. So, if there are two levers, one is the big lever or the small lever, the difference between these two levers should be at least 20 percent. If you have ever driven a tractor, you will realize that there is two levers, one for the gear and the other for forward or backward motion or quick and slow motion. The quick and slow motion of the tractor is handhold lever whereas, the gear is also a handhold lever. But the quick and slow motion is guided by a smaller lever which is almost 50 percent the size of the big lever which controls the speed of the tractor in terms of 1, 2 and 3 speed. And this is a good example of using size control. Size coding can also help in communication functions. So, not only differentiating control, but functions can also be coded through size. Example, larger controls might operate the most important part of a system that is large controls are probably more important than smaller controls. So, in our tractor example. <coughs> The fast and slow speed is not an important property of the farmland. Only when traveling on roads, this property is really needed. On the other hand, the different gears are really important because that will tell the speed at which the tractor or any other equipment like the farm thresher which is, which is attached to the tractor moves. And so, the function can also be controlled and explained through the size of this lever. Another interesting coding mechanism of control is called resistance. Now, certain controls provide resistance and this resistance tells the user that 
this control is meant to do an important function. Stop signs or stop buttons on equipment have a lot of resistance which tells the user that this is going to do something unusual. Chains which are pulled on trains have this resistance. So, if you pull that it will not pull with a easy effort the chains on trains they give you resistance to remind you that this is going to do a function which is not usually done or those controls on the microscope. So, the microscope lever the rotary control cannot be moved with quick actions they move with discrete actions and with resistance the reason being that simple movements or uh, small movements within the microscope dial can lead to larger uh, changes in the focus and so they are meant in such a way that very small very quick movements are uh, resisted. Now, controls can be made easier or safer to use by the amount of force required to activate them. Resistance opposes the force applied by the control operator. Highly resistant controls feel stiff and difficult to activate and this can be an important safety feature that prevents accident activation of controls that have drastic consequences. So, this resistance tells the user that you are going to do a unusual action and this reminds the user once more that taking charge of this control or operating this control is going to do something unusual. So, in normal situations the user if he presses that particular uh, emergency button he will soon realize that he does not have to press it in normal situations or at least he will come to know that this is uh, pressing this button is not normal. So, he will think about it and then press it only in emergency situations. Now, it is useful for controls to offer some resistance which can provide feedback to the operator in terms of their activation. Many joysticks offer elastic resistance so they return to a neutral or home position when released. So, elastic resistance if you have played games on uh, your play box or playstation you will realize that the joystick gives you a certain kind of elastic resistance in uh, response to your motion. So, this suggests or this gives you a kind of a warning or kind of a information regarding the system state. This is fiction resist rapid and irregular movements which is useful for making precise control adjustments. Now, the fine focus knob on a microscope may need only a very small adjustment, but if the feel of the knob is too loose it may turn too easily resulting in too large an adjustment thus achieving just the right focus may prove difficult. In microscopes smaller movements can lead to larger changes in focus and so the knobs offer greater resistance so that only a very small amount of desired pressure should be applied on them and that could lead to changes in focus. So, vicious friction is another way of resistance coding in controls. Another form of coding controls is by using location. So, location can be used to indicate functions to discriminate between otherwise similar looking controls or for convenience. Light switches are placed near doorways or safety emergency shut off controls. Location of a control also help us in discriminating controls from one another and explaining its function. One example that I have put here are light switches for doorways or for emergency controls near the doorway. When you are inside a room you would not need an emergency control to shut off the door. If a shut off door emergency control is provided in the cabin or the room that you are working it should be near the door because that press will open the door immediately and you can move out. So, location is greatly important in coding control behavior. Sometimes 
the location of control may be somewhat arbitrary but based on user expectation can be cannot be rearranged these user expectations are known as population stereotypes based on the idea that different beliefs or expectations arise within a given population of users now sometimes you will find that the location of such a controls and the expectation of people they are not correct but designers don't correct these location coding for the simple reason that people are so familiar using these controls that it becomes difficult later on to change this control look at your car your accelerator brake and clutch three important parts are controlled by different foots whereas the right leg is controlling the accelerator and the brake the left leg is controlling the clutch now in driverless cars you have just two control in automatic cars you have two controls one for the brake the other for the accelerator and you would find that the brake which is an emergency function is provided to your right leg to your left leg and the right leg controls the accelerator now good control coding suggests that the leg which is the dominant should have the brake and the leg which is the non dominant should have the accelerator so the control should be opposite but people are so used to use the left and right leg with the brake and the accelerator that changing these controls would be difficult this type of previous learning which makes users comfortable with wrong design controls are called population stereotypes now population stereotypes are related to location coding involves sinks or tubs with separate knobs for controlling the flow of hot and cold water now it is very common that the hot water control is on the left if you go to any hotel the left is hot water and the cold is coming from the right knob and this is true for wherever you go in the world if for the design purpose you switch these controls or you give one uh, knob for controlling both the hot and cold water even then people try moving the control or the knob to the left for hot and to the right for control any change in this behavior will be a problem for the user so sticking to this kind of a association of function with the movement of the control is called a population stereotype the location of control relative to the system they control can help communicate function by putting the control next to the uh, object that they, it is controlling can actually help and so if you look here there are two different arrangements of gas stuff with different controls the one which is a should be a better control because it is size coded as well as location coded on the other hand if you look at b which is not even size coded and not location coded are the one that you actually find in gas stoves but b people are so happy using that they wouldn't shift to the a control computer controls computer keyboard computer mice these are also coded in such a way that people get familiar with it the qw ert keyboard that we generally use or the motion of mouse that we use for inputting text these are so popular that any change in the keyboard lay layout is not accepted and people find a lot of problems the qw ert keyboard is not such a popular keyboard or is not a such a popular mechanism or it is not so soundly supported by any cognitive principle but still it is widely used there are two keyboard designs uh, which is in front of you and this is the most famous design that you find in keyboards and this design is the one which is a modified design which is called the dovark simplified keyboard now cognitive work and experiments suggest that this keyboard is far better than this keyboard in terms of performance and inputting data into a computer but people are so familiar with this keyboard that they get stick to this now qwt rt is actually designed to slow down typing rate why don't we switch to a faster layout like the simplified to work keyboard the simple reason is people are 
comfortable with the current keyboard and would not like to move. So, any improvement in keyboard has to be following the QWERT type keyboard. There is another factor which we should be concerned about is called the control display compatibility. What it means is what is the relation between the control movement and the display movement? How is the display which signals the control action and the control they are related and this compatibility can be explained on two grounds. The first is called the spatial compatibility or the spatial relation in terms of the display of the control and the control. Spatial arrangements of control should match spatial arrangements of display or the system being controlled. We just looked at the previous example where I explained to you how these gas stuff they are incorrect. The spatial display compatibility or the control display compatibility suggests that these controls are spatially arranged and this should be a good cooktop because each control is linked to its stuff. On this one, it is very difficult to know whether this control switches this one or this control switches this one or is it uh, going this way the control or is it going this way the control. Right? So, whether I move from here or should I move from here, this is difficult. And so, one thing while designing control that we should designers should use is spatial compatibility. The other important function that designers should be aware of is called movement compatibility. The direction of the control movement should match direction of motion in the control system. Example, pulling back on the flight stick in an aeroplane results in accent. Is this the best mapping? Now, movement compatibility suggests that the motion that you move on the lever of the control should be mapped to the action of the vehicle that you are driving. So, when you press the gas pedal, the car moves forward, but pressing is an action to apply force so that something should go down and the car does not go down, but it moves forward. Similar is the example that I have used here, where pulling the lever back makes the flight go up, whereas pulling the lever in the front makes the flight come down. This is an incompatible motion because technically the control should be vertical, where if you move the control up. So, if you have the flight control in such a way that this is the control and if you move it up, the flight also moves up and if you move it down, the flight also moves down. This is a much better way of controlling because forward and backward movement are not related to the motion of the flight. So, while moving control, designers should understand that it should be mapped to the movement. Movement compatibility in Warwick's principle. Another consideration in compatibility is the type of movement to be made related to the type of movement displayed. Look at old days radios. If you move the knob in a circular way, the band moves in a linear way. So, you would have seen this kind of radios earlier days radios and here there are different stations and this is a knob. Now, the knob moves in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction and this station changer or this lever which demonstrates the station moves in a linear way. This is an incompatible movement. We should have displays in this way where if you move this knob down, this should move up and if you move it in the other direction, it should move down. This is a much better way of displaying motion than using the linear way. Now, for example, when turning in a radio station on an old fashioned analog display, the station indicator travels linearly across the display, but most radio knobs are dials that rotate. A good rule of thumb is that the rotatory dial controls are best for radial displays and linear or sliding controls are best for linear display. As I explained that you should have instead of having this rotor, you could have a linear button and the mo the motion you do to this linear button will this will move this station selector or band selector and that is a much better way of 
compatibility between the display and the control function. Warwick's principle suggests that the side of the rotary dial closest to the display should move in the same direction as the display. So, the motion if I have a display like this which has a lever and it also moves linearly with this station indicator, the motion of this display is made in such a way that the motion of this lever should be following it and this is the definition of Warwick's principle. While using rotary knobs to control the red indicator in a linear display as I was explaining instead of this motion we should use this kind of a motion. So, Warwick's principle states that the edge of the knob closest to the display this one should move in the same direction as the indicator. So, here the edge if this is the edge if it moves in this way the dial should also move in this way. Here this is the edge if it moves in this way this dial is also moving in this way and this simple function that the edge of the indicator or the corrector or the pointer in the indicator should make a motion in the same direction as the control uh, display is moving. Control display compatibility. Scaling relation between size of the control movement related to the size of the display movement. Now, there should be also a con control and uh, display ratio or compatibility which says that scaling relation between size of the uh, con uh, control movement and related to the size of the display movement. When using a rotary knob to control indicator in linear display, how far should the indicator move in response to the quarter turn of the knob? So, there should be a relation. Think of your mice, mice that you have. Now, if you have a 16 or 19 inch screen, the motion that you do on the mouse is small, but the pointing uh, arrow on the screen moves in a non-linear fashion. So, a small movement on the mouse makes large movement or sometimes small movement of this arrow on the screen. This uh, relation should be balanced and that is what is the example that we are studying or is, is the relation that we are trying to understand. So, what ratio should it be? Also, when using a computer mouse to move the on screen pointer, how far should the pointer move in response to a 5 centimeter movement of the uh, mouse? The idea is that the motions of the mouse are non linearly related to the motions on the display pointer on your screen. It is controlled with something called speed and something called uh, motion, uh, mo motion movements. So, small ratios are good for fine positioning movements. Example, to tune a station in the radio very precisely, it is better that large rotations of the knob result in very small movements of the indicator in the display. Large ratios are good for covering longer distances. For example, to move a moist pointer across very large monitor display, it is better that small movements of the mouse result in large movements on the screen. So, this is how the compatibility should be. It is it should not be one to one, it should be mapped in such a way that the motion that your physical device the mice does should be uh, mapped in such a way with the display that smaller motions on the mice could be larger motions on the display. Control display tracking. Now, tracking occurs when we move a control and then observe how the system responds. Continuous control operations accompanied by continuous observation of system state which is called the tra uh, tracking loop similar to the feedback loop. Think about driving a car. Here we have something called tracking. So, while we increase the speed or decrease the speed or think of the steering wheel, while we move the steering wheel to the left and right, we track our motions by smaller movements of the uh, wheel, the steering wheel, we can adjust the car into the lane that we want and we continuously keep on tracking the motion that we do on the steering wheel and the motion of the vehicle. So, this is an idea of tracking. Now, the display that I explained to you the steering wheel has something called a negative feedback loop because what would happen is you would not know uh, whether your motions lead to what kind of action, but it can tell you that this motions whether it has corrected itself. So, negative feedback loop is it will give you whether you are in the correct direction or not. 
whether your vehicle is the correct direction or not by making motions on the uh, uh, wheel, steering wheel. So, this is a negative feedback loop. Now, control adjustments are made to keep the systems in a desired state. Input adjustments made to the control and output the system response to the control. Another important feature that we should be worried about is tracking and control dynamics. Now, the concept of com control dynamics defines the relationship between the command input and the system response to it. In order to con in order of control defines the complexity of this relation. So, control dynamics is how tracking the uh, vehicle or tracking the object and the controlling they are related to each other. So, there are different types of this control dynamics with the different kind of tracking control. Now, zero order control position uh, or also known as position control is the simplest control order and implies a, a simple linear relationship between command input and system output. It is called position control because changing the position of the control changes the position of the system. The example is stationary position of the mouse on the mouse pad maps position of on screen pointer. So, the tracking of the movement that you are doing and the, con the type of mo uh, motions or functions on the control, this mapping these two is called understanding tracking and control dynamics and zero order, order control are those control where the position control is the simplest control. Here there is one to one relation an example is stationary position of the mouse on the mouse pad is mapping on to the position of the computer screen. So, here is first order the motion that you do on the mouse. So, I am doing a motion on the mouse and this is directly being coded on to the motion of this pointer here on the screen. Now, there are first order controls which is not directly related to the motion of the uh, person who is controlling the operator who is controlling. Rather, the motion of the operator is translated into the first degree of control. I will try and explain what does this mean. So, also known as the first order control, velocity control involves a slightly more complex control dynamics. The control and the motion that the user does are not directly related one to one, but it is related through a different uh, framework or a different function. Now, in this case changing the position of the control does not affect the position of the system rather it affects the velocity of the system. So, here changing the control itself is not going to affect the display or the control as such, but it is going to influence a secondary order function of the control. An example is position of gas accelerator or pedal in the car determining the velocity of the car. So, the more you press on the pedal it will get translated in terms of speed of the car, but it will not get in translated in terms of how much the car goes down. So, pressing on the pedal relates to the motion of the car which is not directly controlled because the motion that you provide on the pedal should move the vehicle down, but that is not what it is doing. This motion gets translated into the speed which is a second order function. There is a third order function or the second order control which is called the acceleration control represents the most complex control dynamics commonly known as in the tracking loops. But this dynamic as per this dynamic a change in the control position determines the acceleration of the system. So, here another level of the control gets manipulated by manipulating the control itself. An example is position or angle of the steering wheel determines the lateral acceleration or turning of the car. So, here by simply moving your steering wheel does not tell you how the car is or at what angle the car is, uh, is moving or bending. This is defined in terms of the motion of the wheel and the speed that the car has. The speed and the motion of the wheel which you are uh, manipulating through your steering wheel together will define at what angle your car is going to uh, bend or your car is going to make a turn. And so, this is a third order control. So, directly uh, your uh, movement of your steering wheel or the more steering wheel that you move is not related to uh, the same amount of motion of the wheel. You have seen this in, in wheels. So, if you if you rotate the wheel twice or thrice, it will not totally rotate 
the uh, wheels of the car. So, so, complete rotation of the steering wheel not uh, rotate the uh, uh, vehicle's wheel and which in turn will also not rotate the car 360 degree. So, but uh, this total rotation of the wheel gets converted into the motion of the wheel plus in addition to the speed of the car will determine how much angle or how much turn the car is doing and so this is known as the uh, second order control. Now, one important aspect of control dynamics is called system lag or time delay in responding to control input. Now, in steering a car for example, it takes time for a change of the steering wheel angle to be transmitted to the linkages in the steering column and to the axle of the wheel and hence there is a delay however slight between the movement the driver turns the wheel and the time of the car actually responds to changing direction. So, another important feature in control dynamics is you have to think about the lag. So, the motions are not directly converted, the motions on the control are not directly con uh, converted in terms of control actions, but there is a lag and this has to be understood. Now, another factor that affects lag is the inertia of the system. Inertia is the system's resistance for movement. More force is required to move heavy objects than a light one. Further, it takes longer to get heavy objects moving. Look at a big truck. Now, the amount of pressure that, that is put on the pedal directly does not relate to the speed of the truck. So, if you put too much pressure, slowly the truck will accelerate, but if it is loaded as compared to when it is no, uh, not loaded, the speed will vary. When it is loaded, it will slowly climb speed, but stopping it would be difficult. So, this is called uh, inertia related lag. On the other hand, when the, when the truck is totally empty, the speed can be somehow uh, related to uh, how much pressure you are putting on the pedal. Tracking and display system states. Now, key component to the tracking uh, task is the nature of the display that provides information to the operator about the system state and the effector of his or her commands. Drivers rely on speedometers to provide feedbacks about car's response to acceleration and on seeing the front end of the car and the lines of the road through the windshield in order to get information about car's response to steering wheel. So, uh, what drivers tend to do is they look at the steering wheel and they look at the side of the road and the speedometer and this combined together will tell whether they are driving in the right lane or whether their driving is poorly affected. Now, there are two type of tracking displays one is called the pursuit and the other is called uh, the uh, compensatory. So, what is pursuit display? In pursuit display you have fixed uh, uh, positions as in the final position and the uh, starting position. So, pursuit displays and compensatory displays. So, pursuit display tracks tracking displays shows the system state and the desired state. The difference between these two is the error state. The operator's goal is to reduce error by getting the system state in a display to match the desired state. For example, uh, the sideline on the curb on the road. So, you have a curb on both sides and you have the vehicles. Uh, front bonnet and by looking at the curb and the bonnet you can uh, come in a position which is in between which is the lane length and so you will be safe. So, this is called a per pursuit display. On the other hand you have something called com compensatory display tracking which shows only the error state. So, it will tell you how much error you are committing it will not tell you what is the desired state or what you should be doing. No information is given to the operator as to whether the error state is due to change in the system that is the car has moved away from the desired state or control state that is the steering wheel has moved away from the desired state. Nevertheless, the operator uses this information about the existence of errors to reduce it. So, you are driving on the car and somebody honks from behind. Now, you come to know that you have crossed the lane mark and so now you have to correct and come back to your lane because you are in error state, you are in, in between lanes and so you do not know how to come back to the lane. So, what you have to do is you have to look at your speedometer, you have to look at your steering wheel and the lane dividers and combine all these information together to move your car in such a way that you get in between the lane so that people start uh, not honking at you and you be in your lane. So, this is called compensatory tracking. You will not know what to do to correct the error, but there are several things that you can do to correct the error. As might be expected, pursuit delay tends to be result in better performances, probably because the operator has more information about the source of the error state. Now, pursuit displays are better because people know what they are doing right now and where they should be 
after doing the correction. In compensatory display, the, you do not have this kind of information, you have a lot of information which tells you what you should be doing and how this information should be used to correcting the error. But what is the error and where you should be that is not evident. So, there are uh, on the screen there are uh, tracking on on screen pointer that moves from direction of desired icon, the pursuit tracking display and the then you have the speedometer which is the compensatory tracking display. So, in today's class we looked at controls, the design of controls, various functions of controls and what modification should be done in controls. So, that we have a much better system and operator interaction which leads to higher performances. This is all for today's lecture. Namaskar and goodbye from the MOOC studio. Thank you.